sing with us. All the saints and angels bow before your throne. Their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. verse again.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that name that is so powerful. Jaslyn, great job. And Big Paul did all right on guitar, didn't he? Big Paul, let's give Big Paul a hand. Great. Thank you, Jaslyn. What a great song. What a great name, the name of Jesus. No wonder he said, you must become like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Us adults get so tainted by the world, don't we? Kind of wears us down, chips away. But here's the beauty of it. Jesus, give me the faith of a child. Help me to see people the way you see them and the world the way you see it. It's a beautiful thing. Kids, you're dismissed to go to kids' church. All the kids heading to kids' church. All right. If you got your bulletins, take them out real fast. I just want to draw your attention to a couple important things. 
before we jump into uh, this uh, second part of the Articles of Faith. I'm not going to read it to you, obviously. You can see at the top of the announcement section, the Heave Love Offering. What we need, what we received. If you want to continue to give to that to help us reach that goal, uh, do that. Uh, you obviously need to mark it Heave Love Offering if you write a check. Maybe some of you did that today. And uh, we're wanting to do that to put in security cameras inside our buildings and outside our buildings and do upgrades to our Wi-Fi. So it's about $2,500 to do that. So thank you all for your giving and your willingness to give. Uh, That's a great thing. Uh, The third one down there, the new uh, uh, prayer time announcement, the leadership team and I uh, are wanting to lead you all into greater faith. Uh, I care about your soul. You're going to live forever. It's not my job to save you. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. No more than going to McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. You must be saved. And the greatest tool we have is prayer. So starting on Sunday morning, September 8th at 1030, this room will be available for prayer to allow you to come in and prepare yourself for worship. Push yourselves We're all busy all week long, and I get it. You may come in tired and exhausted. I promise you, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of prayer before worship will get you focused in the right way, and your worship will be different because of it. And if you can only pray for five minutes and you just want to sit and listen, we're going to have music on. We're going to have scriptures going on and off of the screen. We have a great resource for that. But to be in silence before the Lord, be still and know that I am God. If we rush into church and not even thought about that he's God, and then we want him to bless us, God says, we're not on the same page. Prayer is the way to do that. So we're going to be starting that. Along with that, when you walk out of the sanctuary and turn to the left, the leadership team has turned that room into a prayer room. And we are organizing prayer, part of our prayer ministry team people to be in that room after church every Sunday morning. And if you just have a deep sense where you've encountered God and maybe it was a challenge to come forward, maybe as your, as your the service ends and you just have this deep sense, I, wanna, I need to ask somebody something, then the prayer room is where you want to go. Because it will be a private place with prayer warriors in there and it can be a conversation, it can be a prayer, they pray over you. You can ask questions and perhaps get the answer that you're looking for. We are just investing in prayer To do as the church is supposed to do, the more you pray, the more God does. The less you pray, the less God does in your life. Same thing in a church. The more a church prays, the more God does in that church. The less a church prays, the less God does. And I am not interested anymore in my life, the time I have left, of just going through the motions of church. We must worship in the presence of God. We must worship in thanksgiving and reverence and awe. And we must be willing to sacrifice whatever we need to to get the presence of God into the church. And you know what happens when God shows up? You and I will show up, heart, mind, soul, and body. And he'll draw other people in because the presence of God is so powerful, so life-changing. And so prayer is a way to do it so you can see Uh, Those kind of details know that that is available to us for you personally and for us corporately. Who uh, Who can quote today? Ben, bring it on the screen. Ha, ha, ha. Who can quote today our theme verse for the year at Turkey Creek Church? That's the first verse you've ever quoted from memory. That is amazing. Wow. Oh, it's on the screen. No. That's our theme verse. Great job, Amy. Uh, I encourage you to memorize that. This is where God's leading us. Now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be the glory in the church. In the church, he gets the glory. And that's why we pray. And so God given us a vision that he wants to do immeasurably more in your personal life this year, which is designed to carry on from every year after. He wants to do immeasurably more in the life of the church than he's ever done before. And this church has had some incredible immeasurably more seasons, haven't you? 
You've been in the presence of God. You've seen God do immeasurably more. And we want to get more and more of that in this year. And so the Lord's leading us. And so in this process, we follow the Lord's leadership that, that uh, we want you to understand who we are as the Church of the Nazarene. So we're in this series, The Church of the Nazarene Explained. And uh, today we're doing kind of the same format we did last week as we're covering the Articles of Faith. Our 16 Articles of Faith. I said this last Sunday, if you missed it, it's, it's really easy to understand. It's, it's like the U.S. Constitution. That's our Constitution. That is the unchangeable, defining, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we do it, this is why we do it. It ain't going to change. It's the Constitution of the Church of the Nazarene. And so we did the first eight last Sunday, we'll do the, the, the last eight today. And uh, if, if at any time you want to ask a question, you can do that. Raise your hand and we'll help you work through that. If you're online and you want to send a text and later I can respond to you. If you have any questions as we cover these things, very important to understand. If you understand the church that you're a part of, you're going to get more out of that church. If you don't understand who we are, and you don't understand why we believe what we believe and how we believe and what we really believe in the Bible, then you're just going to come and be religious. And I'm not interested in pastoring religious people. I want to pastor people with a relationship, and all of you have that, because that's the guarantee of God's presence by the prayers and the relationship we share. So it's important we cover these. So t today, right now, I'm going to go through the first eight real quick to kind of just tie the dot together, okay? So, Ben, we're going to go back to the beginning there, to the first one. And I'm going to pause if you want to ask a question because you don't understand it. I'll explain as fast as I can. Ready? The first one is the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Second article of faith is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We know who he is. We know what he did for us. Any questions? Anybody good? The third article is the Holy Spirit. This is God's spirit, God's presence, God's power, God's miracles, God's strength. He gives to us and all that comes with it comes through the Holy Spirit. The next one is the Holy Scriptures. Now, we believe the Bible from cover to cover is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God that God gave to different authors at a, at a, a span of over 1,500 years and he brought it all together that tells his story. And that's a story of redemption and salvation and grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. But it's also interesting because it's full of murder and lies and rape and sex and violence and wars. But we see a God who manifests himself by his spirit, by his son, and by his power. We believe in sin, both original sin, what we got from Adam and Eve that causes us to sin... And we believe in personal sin. Those are the sins that we choose to do. Whether on our own or out of addiction or the devil's tempting us. That's personal sin. We have two different types of sin. Both need to be dealt with. And thanks be to God through Jesus Christ we have the victory over sin. Amen? About a half of you believe that today. Amen? Amen. We have victory over sin. Then we talked about the atonement. The atonement is the act that Jesus did on the cross to atone to make the payment for our sin. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Then it was provenient grace. This is the grace that we believe in that God works to woo people to him. God will not force us to come to him. He will not force us to ask for forgiveness of sin. But he will woo us and we call that provenient grace. Pre, before you got saved, God was working. He was using mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa and best friend and spouse to show you that he loved you and you come to church and you got in his presence but you're not saved and there's something that burns inside of you and that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that is perfect love that says, hey, you're living in sin but I love you and I want to make a difference in your life. Will you trust me? Will you come to me? Provenient grace. And then we had repentance. Repentance is the work that we do after we get saved. We ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, and we must repent. Remember, when Jesus preached, he didn't say, get saved and get baptized. Did he? What did he say? Come on. Repent 
and be baptized. Repentance is turning away from the sins that you've been committing and walking in complete opposite direction of faith, by faith, in faith, in trust, in obedience to the word of God and the life we're supposed to live. And I repent of it, God. I'm not going to do it again. So give me victory over the enemy where he tempts me. Help me to not hang out with the same crowd and do the same behaviors. That leads me to that personal sin that flows from this original sin in my life. I don't want to go to hell for eternity. I don't want to struggle as a believer. And we have victory because of repentance. Turn away from it. Get out of it. And you can live in victory. So we believe in repentance. All right, here's the next eight. So I'm going to read a section at a time in these. If you have a question, slip up your hand. Most of them are pretty easy to understand. Clarification that I gave last week that's good today is our articles of faith are written by some of our best minds in the church of the Nazarene. Our theologians, our scholars, our doctors at the high level of our universities. God called people, God equipped people that understand theology in every detail. These are the people that write this stuff. So, article number nine is justification, regeneration, and adoption. We're going to explain each of those. Justification, regeneration, and adoption. We believe that justification is the gracious and judicial act of God by which he grants full pardon of all guilt and complete release from the penalty of sins committed and acceptance as righteousness to all who believe on Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior. Any questions? Everybody good? My mama used to say, justified, it's just as if you had never sinned. Justification. The next says, we believe that regeneration or the new birth is that gracious work of God whereby the moral nature of the repentant believer... That's important. The repentant believer is spiritually quickened and given a distinctively spiritual life capable of faith, love, and obedience. So we're regenerated. Anybody play video games in here? You ever ever fall off a cliff in a video game and then you start back at the same place? Good illustration. You're regenerated back in the game. Well, spiritually we are regenerated. New life comes in. Questions on that one? We believe that adoption is that gracious act of God by which the justified and regenerated believer is constituted a child of God. Man, aren't you glad for that one? That he adopts us as his sons and daughters. This is why Jesus taught us to pray. Our heavenly Father The relationship of salvation and repentance and justification and regeneration. We are children of God. The last one on this one, it says we believe that justification, regeneration, and adoption are simultaneous in the experience of seekers after God and are received by faith, preceded by repentance, and that to this work and state of grace The Holy Spirit bears witness. Questions there? Remember the moment when you get up from the altar and you've got peace like you've never experienced? You've got joy. You feel clean. That's what that is. The justification, regeneration, and adoption. That flows from the word of God. So good. All right, our next one here, Article 10, Christian holiness and entire sanctification. We believe that sanctification is the work of God which transforms believers into the likeness of Christ. I'm going to pause there on purpose. That's what it is to be sanctified. Is your heart, mind, soul, life, attitude, actions, morals, values, beliefs, Everything that makes you, you, is a reflection of Jesus and who he is. That original sin, we talked about that last week, 
is removed and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you are chipped away and molded and shaped into the image of Jesus. When you pray, God, I surrender all. Sanctify me. Take the me out of me that makes me sin and fill it with the you that will be in me that will make me like you. That's a powerful prayer. It's a daily prayer. It's a daily encounter. It is wrought by God's grace through the Holy Spirit in initial sanctification or regeneration simultaneous with justification, entire sanctification, and the continued perfecting work of the Holy Spirit culminating in glorification. In glorification, we are fully conformed to the image of the Son. Y'all see the process there? You see, that's not a one and done. That's a daily walk, a daily prayer, a daily encounter, a daily work by prayer itself and the Word of God and accountability and encouragement and all that goes with it. Everybody see that process? And then we are ultimately glorified when we cross the threshold of heaven because we have lived holy lives like Jesus on earth. Now, now I know we're getting deep here. Any questions? Everybody good? Thumbs up if you're good. Thumb down if you're confused. Okay, y'all are, y'all are brilliant. You're smart people. We believe that entire sanctification is that act of God subsequent to regeneration by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity and brought into a state of entire devotion to God and holy obedience of love made perfect. Questions on that one? This, it's a second work of grace. Salvation is the first work of grace. Sanctification is the second work of grace. We have the sacraments that connect us to God's grace. Communion, baptism, the fellowship of the church, the fellowship with the Son, fellowship with the Spirit, fellowship with the Father in our relationship. All of this ties into sanctification. We need to be sanctified. If you are a believer who struggles in your sinfulness, personal sin, and original sin, whether it's maybe what you'd say, well, it's not that big of a sin, I get caught up in gossiping. It's a sin. Well, I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never robbed a bank. It's all sin to God. We are the people that classify sins, don't we? Well, you know, gossip's not as bad as if you kill somebody. Ooh. To God, he sees all sin. It's the same. And so we need to be sanctified, church. If you're sitting there today and you are dry inside in your soul and coming to church is is a good experience, but it just feels like it's the same old thing week after week after week, and you don't have a deep sense of conviction and you're not living in big, deep sins, but you are weak in your faith, you need to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You need to be sanctified afresh and anew. Preacher, I had that at one time. Okay, sounds good, but it sounds like it's faded. If you testify that you're weak, you're struggling, you're empty, something's missing, and I'll tell you, the only thing that's missing is the Holy Spirit in your life. Because the Holy Spirit brings comfort and guidance and conviction and strength and power and wisdom and discernment for everything that we need. Sanctification, we, we need, it's so amazing, It's so amazing. Next one, it is wrought by the baptism with or in filling of the Holy Spirit and comprehends in one experience the cleansing of the heart from sin and the abiding and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit empowering the believer for life and service. Wow, that's the best one of these one descriptions that I'm giving to you. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Entire sanctification is provided by the blood of Jesus, is wrought instantaneously by grace through faith, preceded by entire consecration. And to this work and state of grace, the Holy Spirit bears witness like he does before in other ways. We consecrate ourselves, we give ourselves in all of our sinfulness and God saves us. 
We surrender ourselves in sanctification. And the Holy Spirit makes us like Christ and gives us all we need for life and for service in the kingdom. This is crucial, church. This is crucial. This is, this is our answer by the word of God and the will of God. This is what the church is to do, is to lead people into holiness and to live a life of holiness. It's so important. This experience is also known by various terms. Maybe you've heard some of these different, different phases. Christian perfection, perfect love, heart purity, the baptism with or in filling of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the blessing, and Christian holiness. Those are all the same thing. Don't worry about the term. Just make sure you got it because you'll know it, and the Holy Spirit will bear witness. Any questions there on any of those? We believe that there's a marked distinction between a pure heart and mature character. I'm going to pause there. That's really important. We believe there's a marked distinction between a pure heart and a mature character. We believe there's a difference between salvation and sanctification. You get it? That we are maturing as we live every day in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're becoming like Him. We are getting wise, discerning, maturity. The former is obtained in an instant. You get a pure heart when you come to Jesus. The result, it's attained, the result of entire sanctification, the latter is the result of growth in grace. Growth in grace. If we are not growing in our faith, if we are not into the word every day and applying it to our life, if we're not praying every day, if we're not at church when the doors are open, if we're not worshiping, if we're not being discipled, if we're not growing in our faith, we are not going anywhere in this world spiritually. You're going to stay at the same place. Holiness designs us to mature, to become more and more like Christ. You cannot arrive at a point in your life before you take your last breath, that there's not some other area that Christ could do more work in you. That's why discipleship is so important. That's why prayer meeting is so important. These things that the church offers backs up what the church teaches, that God's people will take it and apply it and live it out. We believe that the grace of entire sanctification includes the divine impulse to grow in grace as a Christ-like disciple. However, this impulse must be consciously nurtured and careful attention given to the requisites and processes of spiritual development and improvement in Christ-likeness of character and personality. Without such purposeful endeavor, one's witness may be impaired and the grace itself frustrated and ultimately lost. Participating in the means of grace, especially the fellowship, disciplines, and sacraments of the church, Believers grow in grace and in wholehearted love to God and neighbor. Questions? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That helps us understand. Article 11 is the church. The church. We believe in the church. The community that confesses Jesus Christ is Lord. The covenant people of God made new in Christ. The body of Christ called together by the Holy Spirit through the word. God calls the church to express its life in the unity and fellowship of the spirit. In worship through the preaching of the word, observance of the sacraments, and ministry in his name. By obedience to Christ, holy living, and mutual accountability. Paul's there. Questions? Now know that when we say the church, we first of all talk about the universal church. The universal church that Jesus started, that today has true Christians in it. And the word of God is preached. And the ministries are real. And the Holy Spirit bears witness in the lives that are being transformed. Churches can have doors that are open and lights are on, but don't have the presence of God. And don't have people that are maturing in their faith are missing it. 
It's not the church. We believe the church is the one that Jesus started. The mission of the church in the world is to share in the redemptive and reconciling ministry of Christ in the power of the Spirit. The church fulfills its mission by making disciples through evangelism, education, showing compassion, working for justice, and bearing witness to the kingdom of God. The church does not exist for the people that are in it. If it does, you ain't going to find much of God. Because the church is never about us. It's always about Him. His will being done. Disciples being made. People being saved. Lives being transformed. Marriages being changed. The next generation shown mature characteristic living like Christ. That is the church. And we're only in here. What? Six hours a week? But we're out there 162 hours a week? And you know what the world needs now? They don't need love, sweet love. And the world don't need a Coca-Cola. The world needs Christians who are real. This community needs a spirit-filled, spirit-led church where the broken and the hurting and the sinful can walk through our doors and find unconditional love and grace and mercy and the word is preached and the Holy Spirit anoints it and God speaks to them. We don't justify people, therefore we cannot judge people. And if we judge people as believers, we sin. Because Jesus said it, Matthew 7, 1, Do not judge, lest you will be judged. So we need to be a church that the doors are wide open. We pray in the presence of God and the power of God. We believe in the New Testament church. Last one here. The church is a historical reality that organizes itself in culturally conditioned forms. Exists both as local congregations and as a universal body. And also sets apart persons called of God for specific ministries. God calls the church to live under his rule in anticipation of the consummation at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like that last line, Miss Rita, because even though I'm the pastor and the Bible says I'm the spiritual leader of the church, it ain't up to me. And I don't have the authority. And I don't have the power. He does. It's his church. And so I seek him to say, Lord, what do we need to preach? What do we need to sing? What ministries do we need to do? How do we need to organize ourselves? What do we need to do, God? And God shows us, and you take it to the leadership, and the leadership gives it to the people, and the people follow the leadership. What's happening? The church is being the body of Christ in the world today. That's why our mission statement says, we are his hands, his feet, his heart, his mission. The church questions on the church article 12 is baptism we believe that Christian baptism commanded by our Lord is a sacrament signifying acceptance of the benefits of the atonement and incorporation into the body of Christ Paul's there a couple big theological words benefits of the atonement what Jesus has done for us. Incorporation into the body of Christ. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Baptism is a means of grace. Proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. It is to be administered to believers. Indicating their full purpose of obedience. In holiness and righteousness. As participants in the new covenant, young children and the morally innocent may be baptized upon request of parents or guardians. The church shall give assurance of Christian training. Baptism may be administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. So as the church of the Nazarene, we do not believe that baptism saves us. Therefore, we do not baptize children thinking it will save them. Baptism is a means of God's grace that incorporates us into the body that is a testimony of how we've been atoned. Start using that word a lot. I've been atoned. I was attuned or out of tuned, but now I'm atoned. Baptism is a testimony of that. 
And we can do it by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. I've done all three. I baptized a man in Louisiana who was riddled with cancer from head to toe. We spent three years praying for him and praying for a miracle and praying for healing and, and uh, praying for him to get saved. And he just kept rejecting it, rejecting it, rejecting it. I'd go to the nursing home and see him. He was only 42 years old. And finally, he accepted Christ one day. But his body was so riddled and he was so much in pain, there'd be no way I could put him under. And I said, I could pour a baptism water over. Please, I need to be baptized. I'm about to die. And so one of the families in the church said, Preacher, uh, I know you know the baptism in the front of the sanctuary is broke. I said, yeah, got a bad leak in it. He said, let's go baptize him in our pool tonight. So we gathered around the swimming pool at the Tarver's house. And I bent down with a big old pitcher into that pool water and brought it up. He just knelt over. And I baptized him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he stood up and I'm telling you, that man encountered Jesus and died a few days later. No matter how you baptize, repent and be baptized. Questions on baptism? Hey, we're winding down. Here's the last four and most of them are pretty short. Article number 13 is the Lord's Supper. We believe that the communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament. It's sacred. Proclaiming his life, sufferings, and sacrificial death, resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. The Lord's Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. All are invited to participate by faith in Christ and be renewed in life, salvation, and in unity as the church. All are to come in reverent appreciation of its significance and by it show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints are invited by Christ to participate as often as possible. Can I say something today? It's just me talking. It's just, it's just Derek. I do communion every Sunday if I knew it wouldn't get boring for us as a church. Because it's a powerful powerful way to worship not only are we reminded but we're challenged not only is it renewed within us but it spurs us on the Lord's Supper is so important questions on the Lord's Supper article 14 divine healing we believe in the biblical doctrine of divine healing and urge our people to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. We also believe God heals through the means of medical science. We believe in healing. God heals because we pray for it. And we wait on it. It's been a challenging week at the Parsonage. I woke up and my lip was three times bigger than it was. Thank God for Benadryl. I've got hives. It just crashed on me three days ago. And yet at the same time, the Lord has just given peace by prayer. Amy's going to be healed. Amy's going to be healed. And when you're confronted with that word, and many of you have been, and you know that deep sinking feeling of death knocking at the door? Oh, man. But I'm glad today that I serve a risen Savior whose father is still healing people. Sometimes it's medical science. Sometimes it takes a long time. But God is still healing people. And if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Article 15, the second coming of Christ. We believe that at the end of the age, the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed as Lord of all. He's going to split the sky and everybody on planet earth is going to see him. The Israelites, the Jewish people, will turn their eyes to the one they killed. He's coming. He will come again in glory and power to establish fully the kingdom of God that he proclaimed and initiated in his life and ministry. As the triune God first created heaven and earth, 
God will renew them in the new creation where he will dwell eternally with his redeemed people. We who are alive at his coming shall not precede them that are asleep in Christ Jesus. But if we are abiding in him, we shall be caught up with the risen saints to meet the Lord in the air so that we shall ever be with the Lord. In that day, God, who in the cross triumphed over all evil powers, will complete his loving purposes for creation. There will be no more suffering, injustice, or death, and God will wipe away every tear from his people's eyes. He's coming, church. He's coming way sooner than you think he is. Are you watching the news? Are you staying attuned with Russia and Iran and Syria, which we are very confident, I'm very confident, as your pastor and friend, that is Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38. They are preparing for war to attack Israel. Ezekiel 38 is coming. That's how we know we're in the last days. The lawlessness in America, the lawlessness around the world, the looting, the rioting, the violence. This is all biblical prophecy. The faith of many growing cold and turning away from God is biblical prophecy. I'll stop there. I'm telling you, church, he's coming sooner than we think. When God says go and the time is right, the rapture happens. And those who are abiding in him will be caught up with him in the air and meet those who were believers that died before us. And eternity starts. Seven years of tribulation left here on the earth. Preacher, could I make it through the seven years of tribulation if I'm living in sin and I didn't make it to the rapture? Yeah, but you're going to be really hard because I don't know who's going to have a key to this church. And the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit will leave the planet Earth. And the spirit of lawlessness, which is the Antichrist, Satan's number two guy, will come. It'll be very difficult to live in the victory of Jesus during the tribulation. But if you can do it, and you can survive without eating... Because you'll have to have the mark of the beast to buy groceries in a one world economy. You'll have to be known as being one of them. You can make it, I guess. Everybody, don't play games with God any longer. The day for doing church the way you and I want to do it or the way we think it should be done is over. He's coming soon. Amen? He's coming. Thank God for atonement and grace and forgiveness and the power of the Holy Spirit. The last one, we're done. Everybody say yay. Well, some of you want to stay longer. Okay, all right. The last article of faith of the Church of the Nazarene. Resurrection, judgment, and destiny. Resurrection, judgment, and destiny. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. That the bodies both of the just and of the unjust shall be raised to life and united with their spirits. Quote, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's the Holy Scripture. Questions there? This is the one article where when you read it you kind of go, ouch, wow. But it's true. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. So those who have died who were in the faith, resurrected to life. Those who have died who were not in the faith, resurrected to damnation. I'm going to go ahead and say it now. I was going to say it later. I'll say it now. I say it all the time. I want you to understand this. God does not send people to hell. That's not biblical. People will send themselves to hell for eternity because they chose to reject all that God did and gave to us. That's why at the judgment, you've heard this, he says, depart from me because I never knew you. 
We never had a real relationship. You were religious. You were faithful to go to church on Sunday morning. You were kind. You were giving. You were, you were sweet. You were precious to others. You loved your neighbors. You loved yourself. But we never really fully knew each other. And that's the work that Satan does on believers. To get us to be just good. Good. We're good people. Goodness does not get us into heaven. Goodness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit from holiness and sanctification that comes from our character. And so there is a resurrection for believers and unbelievers. All right, that's kind of deep. I know it is. Any questions? Everybody okay? If you're saved, you don't have to worry about the last half of that one. You're good. You're good. We believe in future judgment in which every person shall appear before God to be judged according to his or her deeds in this life. So sinners are judged by their sinful deeds. Believers are judged by their believer needs. Everybody okay? We do not believe or think that when Derek stands before God, he's going to air all the sin only. No, we are judged on our relationship with him. But we do believe in the judgment. Every person will stand before God. Every child of the age of accountability will stand before God. Every teenager will stand before God. Every person will stand before God at the judgment where Jesus taught where the sheep and the goats are separated. And heaven and hell takes place. Last one. If I say, woo, we're done. We believe that the glorious and everlasting life is assured to all who savingly believe in and obediently follow Jesus Christ our Lord. And that the finally impenitent shall suffer eternally in hell. How many of y'all seen uh, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade? So there's a bridge that he can't see. It's only a penitent man can pass. And he has to quote that. And in the movie, you can't see it. And all of a sudden, only a penitent man can pass. And he puts his faith and he steps and he crosses and whatever, whatever. That's the opposite of an impenitent person. A person with no faith. A person with sins have not been forgiven. Those are the people that will go to hell for eternity. So our understanding of our articles of faith is crucial. This understanding of these 16 things not only define you as a member of the Church of the Nazarene, but gives you a clear understanding of who we are and what we believe in. My hope is that in your understanding of these, and if you want to talk about them more, please call me. That'd be great. I'd love to do that. I want you to understand each of these because of all the things that will happen. Two are the most important. It'll make you stronger in your faith as you follow Jesus obediently. And the Holy Spirit will burn in your bones to look at your loved ones and say, I just need five minutes. I need to tell you about Jesus and what he's done in my life. I know we've never talked about it. I know it's a silent topic. I, I know we avoid at Christmas politics and religion. Every family does it. But I need you to know that he's coming. And I love you so much that I need to tell you, you have got to get saved. And if you want to know how, let me know. I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not trying to force you into something. I just need you to know I love Jesus so much for what he's done for me and I love you just the same as my family member. You need to be saved. It's hard. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. God bless you. Have a great week. We're going to go ahead and stop the broadcast.